Hello everyone and welcome to another Scots Way podcast. I'm joined today by writers Graeme McRae Burnett and Graeme Laroni. Hello guys. Hello. Hello. And I uh, hope there'll be no confusion with the two Graemes. We'll crack on and see. I might have to change it as we go along. But you're both, one of the reasons I've got you both together, apart from that I um, really enjoyed your books that came out this year, is that you're both published by Contraba- uh, Contraband. Mm-hmm. Which is the nominally the crime fiction imprint of Sarah Band books. Um, so perhaps Graham yes. McRae Burnett, yes. if you could say a little <laughs> bit about contraband. I mean, because uh-huh. my idea is crime fiction brings its own baggage sometimes when people <laughs> discuss it. But both books are very different, mm-hmm. and actually, what contraband produces is very different. Yeah, I mean, from what I understand from Sarah Hunt, who's the kind of CEO of Sarah Band books. The idea of contraband was really to publish crime novels that um, were not kind of totally mainstream, uh, recognisably genre genre crime novels, and uh, I, I don't really want to speak on her behalf. Sure. Um, but I mean, certainly with my two books, the disappearance of Adele Bado and the new book, uh, His Bloody Project, um, neither of them I think fit entirely into the a kind of certain idea of crime fiction and certainly with his bloody project I think of it as a, a novel about a crime yeah. rather than a crime novel sure. um, so yeah and I've had a lot of discussions about you know whether it's a crime novel or uh, or not and different people have a different kind of definition of uh, what a crime novel is um, Russell McLean who does the re- crime reviews for the Herald yeah. and for him a crime novel is a novel with a crime in it and you know that's it's a pretty clear definition yeah, and you yeah. can't really argue with it but I think there's still kind of shades of grey within that where um, but I think the shades of grey are the interesting parts yeah. so that's what I yeah, yeah yeah sure yeah. what about yourself Graham? yeah I just can say I'd, I'd never heard of it until there was I think it was Neil Broadfoot's mm. uh, book I'd read about it was on a, on a website and I think that is maybe one of the more conventional if that's uh, a word it's a straight crime novel I think yeah. you can see it set up as a uh, as, a, as an ongoing kind of series, but what attracted me to it was when when I read about the when I read about contraband, and it was Graham's, Neil's, and uh, Michael Malone's book, the guillotine choice. Yeah, three completely different. And when I read on the website just the description, I thought I could hang my little book on, on this. I just it <laughs> might fit in there. Just somebody with a with a broader perspective of what, because I certainly didn't approach it as a crime novel. Yeah, but, um, I, I did see that it, it could feasibly fit into that category. No, it's just, we, we had um, Karen Campbell on a couple of years ago and she started off writing crime fiction and one of yeah. the things that really um, it kind of put her off doing any more of that was the way it was being sold, it was being marketed, the covers, you'll know yeah. exactly what yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. the black and white covers, the yeah. bright font, <laughs> yeah. somewhere down a recognisable place in Glasgow or if they were set in Glasgow, that kind of thing. but. What's really nice for me about contraband is it's bringing, it's it's making crime fiction as um, fit in a literary yeah. genre, yeah. if you like. I mean, yeah. that's the kind of cut a point because yeah. both your books are very literary, I think, in type. Uh, I agree. Yeah, well, I th- I'll just call you Mr. Laroon. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so we're, so we're talked. I mean, that's certainly what I guess I, I aspire to, and I think in the I think well, I mean, I've I've only read. Adele Bado and it's completely different to mine but I think we do both have a uh, an interest in probably metafiction to, yeah, to a degree yeah. and, and there is that but yes I think there is that I just love the word contraband I like yeah, being yeah. <laughs> con- contrabandista I like yeah, it yeah. Uh, and it's, uh, it's nice and I think you're right it does she has that she's got a very eclectic mix of books and Saraband so yeah. and contraband within that it's as wide as it, as it wants to be well, I think originally when I started reading contraband books, my question was, why hasn't this fitted into Saraband? Because there's a wide, yeah. you know, the, your type was wide. But then as further uh, publications came out, you started to see, oh, this is what this is about. Yeah. There's, if there is any themes that they're dark, there is crime mm-hmm. there. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's actually quite nice to have that offshoot, which um, I think people other than me, but certainly me, will go to and say, yeah, I want to read another contraband mm. book. Yeah. Well, it's great to have a brand. Yeah. You know, the, yeah. the brand means something and yeah. uh, it stands for something, that it's going to be something a little bit out of the ordinary 
and not. I mean, I, I did an event um, up in Granton, and they have a little crime festival. But one of the first events I had done was certainly the first uh, sort of crime festival I'd been at, and um, I did a session with Chris Dolan, mm-hmm. and then later on there was a session with uh, Neil Broadfoot, yeah. Alexander Sokolov. Um, I can't remember the two others. Uh, it just off the top of my head, and they all read uh, the opening of their books. Uh, Carol Ramsey one, was one of the others, and uh, all their op- the opening of all their books began with a sort of brutal murder. And uh, somebody like uh, Alexander Sokolov is very open about the fact that this is how you write a crime novel. You begin with a dramatic, probably violent event, and that's what hooks the reader in. And after that, you've got sort of fifty pages of grace to, you know, s- you know, maybe do character yeah. and set the scene and whatnot. And I think the sort of Saraband books, they don't, I mean, and that is a formula and that's not to deride it. No. Um, it's just, a, it's a descriptive thing. And some people are happy to follow that formula. Um, but I think with the Saraband books, they're, they're more in terms of structure and the way they maybe develop characters is a little bit different. Um, and, you know, it's, it's nice to be, you know, sort of in that sort of gang of yeah. sort of yeah. not quite crime books. Because both of your latest novels there are some similarities but they're also completely different as well which I think makes them so interesting to talk about um, with that in mind if you give us a, a little chat about his bloody project and let's give it the full title because full titles are important I think <laughs> yes, for both of you uh, it's well what is it I've got it here it's his bloody project documents relating to the case of Roderick McRae yes. so tell us a little um, bit about it well, his bloody project is set in a very small village called Kaldui in Western Ross in 1869 and concerns a triple murder carried out by a 17-year-old crocker called Roger McCray. And as the, the subtitle of the book's documents relating to the case of uh, kind of describes, the book is told in a series of found documents such as um, police statements and medical statements. Um, but the main document is the prison memoir of Roger McCray himself, which he writes while awaiting trial. Um, so it's really a kind of, I mean, in a way, because you kind of know most of what is going to happen in terms of the murder, you know that from page one. Uh, it's kind of an examination or a dissection of uh, how the lead up to that event and then the repercussions of that event. There's, you know, a, a report of the trial. Um, so. What inspired you to write the book in this way? It was because I, I read uh, in it quite a kind of history of a lot of Scottish literature and particularly things like Stevenson and uh-huh. Hogg and, and, and perhaps even Conan Doyle and things like that. Oh, I mean, I'm very flattered by any sort of comparisons to those kind of writers. Um, I mean, Hogg would be the one because of the structure of Justified yeah. Sinner with its ed- editor's narrative and then the narrative within that is kind of framed by a sort of authorial voice outside the main narrator. Um, You know, I think that's the one that I would say, even on an unconscious level, would have influenced me. Um, But um, there was a case in France in the early 19th century of a French peasant called Pierre Riviere, who uh, killed three members of his own family and then wrote a memoir about it. And that was really um, the most direct inspiration so the, the, the idea of writing a, you know, a, a brutal murderer who then writes a quite elegant, elegant memoir of what he'd done, I was quite fascinated by yeah. that idea. And I think, you know, I, be, I'm, I realize looking back that, you know, I'm quite fascinated by people who do terrible things and then when they're caught just go, yeah, sure, yeah, I did that and here's why. And, you know, that's like people like Dennis Nielsen, the serial killer, who, you know, never made any attempt to elude the police or pretend that he didn't do it and you know openly discussed it as if he had no idea that what he'd done was wrong yeah and yeah. so that i mean that's classic sort of psychopathic mentality i think that's quite fascinating yeah because you build up in a way because by, by through the memoir again a justification for what happens in a mm. sense mm. but then when it, when there's a, a description of what actually happens later on I, I, the thing I thought about the book is you're kind of pulled in every direction, yeah. as you are with your book as well. <laughs> anyway. But uh, um, uh, was that a deliberate thing to kind of play with? Uh, no, it book? wasn't. I mean, because I wrote the I wrote Roddy's memoir, which is you know at least it's probably a third to a half of the book. It's certainly the that's the immersive part of the book that I want the reader to become involved in 
Roddy's world where you know the village he lives in the char- other characters in the village he kind of has a bit of a crush on you know, a girl in the village and I want people to feel that these are real characters Yeah. Uh, so I wasn't writing it with the idea that you know at a certain point I'm going to pull the rug out from the reader's feet I mean and it always sounds a bit strange when writers uh, say this but it was just something that kind of developed as I, as I wrote it and uh, later on when I was writing the trial scenes um, I kind of had a pretty good idea of what uh, Roddy's fate was going to be but the manner in which I got to that point was very different from what I imagine so I don't like to plan ahead so yeah. I mean somebody uh, a friend was just I'd read the book and she's like oh, you're, you're so manipulative and, um, <laughs> and that may be true in life but um, I, you know, wasn't, I wasn't intentionally manipulating the reader yeah. but on the other hand and it was a conversation I had with Sarah the publisher um, without the other dimension I'm not g- giving yeah. away deliberately sure. Sure. Um, Roddy is, is only a victim and um there's a lack of ambiguity. There would be a lack of ambiguity in in the story. So, I think ambiguity is very important for the reader to engage with the characters and take part in sort of making up their own mind about the rights and wrongs of certain actions or whether certain characters are as they seem or are good or bad or something in between. And that you know, I think that's something I'm very keen on. You know, not resolving everything for the reader and allowing a bit of space for sure. you know reading between the lines I think that's what makes it um, interesting that also there are some readers that perhaps don't like to work as hard as that oh, you know, yeah, yeah, no, I'm, I mean, not, I'm not saying they're right I'm just yeah, saying yeah. Okay. You, know, you said you, you don't like yeah. pulling the, the yeah. rug from under people's feet but it is at the beginning sold as a bit of found yeah, material yeah, sure. yeah I mean I, just, I, I, I honestly I had tr- really a lot of trouble uh, when people <laughs> ask me why, why I'm so keen on doing this you know people <laughs> don't know that you know, in the previous in my previous book, um, it ends with an afterwards in which I describe the life of the fictional author of the book, called Raymond Bruni, um, and uh, that did annoy some people. I think some people, for some people, they found it sort of playful and amusing, which is kind of how I wanted it to yeah. be. Uh, other which find, other people, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I'd like things. So I think for other people, they find it a little bit pretentious, um, which is also possibly true. <laughs> but um, I mean, even the, with the first book, you don't really know. Uh, uh, you don't uh, the the main sort of narrative sort of question of the novel is never answered and for some people I mean uh, that's not a problem but I think for people maybe who read generic conventional crime fiction they've been they're not so keen on that yeah they, and a lot of people um, emailed me and stuff and said so um, this is what happened isn't it <laughs> and I'm like I will never answer that question you know just you know I plead the fifth amendment the only reason I mention it actually was because about half an hour ago I just noticed there was a, one of the small Amazon reviews and it was really weird that someone was like, I was really enjoying this book yes. till I got to the end and realised it wasn't what it was supposed to say. Well, no, I mean, I, no, I, yeah, no, 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 it actually says, it's a shame it's all so fake. And I actually, I love that. <laughs> it's fake. I love that. You know, <laughs> that somebody, the accusation that they would put on a novel is, it's fake. And, uh, I, you know, um, I think that's quite funny and... Um, I, I I like to I'm I am drawing attention to the the fact that this is all an artifice. And, yeah. But because of the experience of doing a Del Bado and a few people were a bit miffed. People who were taken in by uh, there's no point doing no. a graphic <laughs> comment <laughs> on the podcast. Um, you have this rabbit here, uh, so uh, <laughs> um, people who um, thought that a Del Bado really was written by a French writer called Raymond Bruni um, were sometimes a little bit miffed when they realised that um, it was written by a Scottish guy, you know, in the Mitchell Library, and um, so when I did um, his bloody project, I inserted the words "a novel" on the title page. Yeah, would you I, think that would give it away? Well, it's just like you know, people won't notice it, but you know, at least when they go, oh, I thought it was all real. Um, I can go. It says a novel on the front page. Yeah. In fact, the the List magazine reviewed the book as a true crime book. So, but I think it, it's a compliment because they it's if. And it was a compliment yeah. when people thought it was a real French novel because, I mean, although I've lived in France for a, a short time, uh, if people feel that it feels authentic enough, I feel like I've achieved something sure. as a writer. Absolutely. So, uh, well, I'm not trying to fool people. You know, I want people to believe in the world of the novel, whether it's 19th And I think, actually, you know, that complaint, someone gets so immersed in it that they believed yeah. it, that's yeah. surely what you're after. Absolutely. That's what I want as a reader, you know. 
I'm talking about playfulness in, in writing um, uh, Mr. Laroni. Um, <laughs> oh, Marina so Girl, yeah. The Death Sentence of a Spaceman. Space so, I don't know, I mean, I, we're trying desperately not to give away spoilers with yeah, both yeah. books here. It's very difficult with your book because part of the fun in reading it is discovering all the kind of puzzles and traps, for yeah. want of a better word, that you've yeah. set. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, and that was part of the trouble in describing it and part of the trouble in writing it. But, but <laughs> it, was, it was a good thing because I'd hit on this very early on, just the, the anagrams do play a part in it. Um, and then I realised there was anagrams of anagrams that more than I'd originally envisaged which oh really uh, we had did this I was going to very quickly cutting down to um, that this is it Lipo you pronounce it kind of, um, that kind oh yeah of the thing. French movement yeah French movement which yeah. I'd been reading about uh, before and that was kind of the, the background to the genesis of this book it was it was it sounds really popular to itself it sounds very uh, but it's a bit it's a writing about writing yeah. which sounds really dull but I wanted oh, to make yeah. that interesting and um, and that's I didn't hit, say oh I'll, I'll do a crime genre but just the way that the narrative led me it kind of ended up it, it can fit into that category but yeah I mean I was I surprised myself with the I ended up in all kinds of cul-de-sacs and writing it and going like, how do I get out of that and yeah the, mm. that cliche that necessity is the mother of invention I found it to be true I just think it, it really it's quite hopefully twisty and turning it in places it reads a bit like, I mean, we we're talking about how crime fiction brings its own baggage with it, but it reads yeah. a bit like pulp fiction as well, and, and kind of American uh, noir, that kind of feel about mm-hmm. it. Was that something yeah. you were deliberately going for? Uh, no, no, uh, no, probably not. Um, I've not read, I mean, I, I don't know about Graham, I don't read a lot of genre fiction, and certainly not genre crime fiction. That said, one of my favourite books has got crime in the title in terms of crime and punishment I think yeah, it would well, fit into one of my favourite books as well um, and the only kind of genre writer that I read I mean years ago I was on holiday I'd, I'd run out of books went to a stall and I picked up this book and I fell in love from the page one I'd never read prose like it and it was um, Chandler yeah. Damon Chandler I think it was fairly well my lovely and I was just mm. this is genius but he's the only pulp fiction writer that I've mm. read yeah that's said since so Marina ago when last year I discovered a guy Robert Coover uh, he's got a book called Mar and which is very it kind of almost updates Marlowe uh, and it's very twisty and dark and uh, so I loved it but no um, it wasn't modelled on or inspired by any kind of noir writers that I was aware of um, but I think you were talking about crime and punishment yeah. there is a sense of um, crime has been committed and you've got to try and work out not just who's committed it but why it's been committed oh, and, yeah, and yeah. why the <clears throat> all these yes mm. all these kind of elements of what I enjoy in books I guess uh, I, I enjoy literary books but I enjoy a plot I enjoy being surprised as a reader as the who's this going or what this character isn't who you thought it was or what is going on I, I like all that when I'm going through and you see you, you know it, you found it difficult to, to kind of get out of um, certain scenes that you built yeah. for yourself. Was that in terms of the, the actual words themselves by by creating various, uh, oh gosh, yeah, you know, yeah, because literary devices, let's yeah, call it that. yeah, no, it was because, um, well, the literary devices it works both ways, they suggest various ways that the plot can develop just by this, this anagram made. Uh, certain um, sections of the book I could fit these into parts of the book so they in, in themselves suggested various plot things that, that, that I could take it but on, on the contrary to that it was oh, wait a minute if it does X mm. and Y then Z doesn't make sense and X, so you need to rewrite and kind of it's been described as a, as a Rubik's Cube of a thing <laughs> I, yeah. I, I, did, yeah, I like all that uh, and that's a, an aspect of it but I hope there's other sides to it as well. I mean, I just, I think, I don't know about you, but when I'm writing a book, it's influences, a whole myriad of influences yeah. of what I'm reading, watching, yeah. listening to, what's going through my head uh, at the time. It was actually, uh, this, I wrote this 15 years ago. Uh, All right. It took 15 months to write and 15 years to find contraband to come along, <laughs> um, which was which was great, but it was kind of not a, so it reads just now when people are smoking in the office and yeah, yeah, the yeah. fax machines 
that's not artifice. I, I can't write the stalking novel. It was off its time. Mm. That's but, very interesting. But finally, it's uh, you know, it's people read it as oh, you've caught the, the late nineties, or it was a turn of the century uh, novel, mm. turn of a millennium novel actually. Yeah. Um, was was when it was written. Um, I don't know what I'm marking on about now. Well, I guess um, both books. Once I got to certain bits, they would force me to go back and reread what I had read uh-huh. previously, yeah, yeah, yeah. and which is a good, a good yeah, thing, absolutely, yeah. because I think it's great when a book makes you yeah. makes you work for some kind of understanding of what's been going on with uh-huh. it, and I think that's what both of them do. Um, so is Omar Reid got written in first person? Yes. Yeah, I think that's a, it's kind of the na- if to me if you're writing in the first person, you know, people talk about the unreliable narrator. I mm, mean. Yeah. Any first person narration to me should be an unreliable yeah. narration. It can't tell you the truth. It can only give a partial point of view, and yeah. you know, or you know, either the person, the narrator, is mis- deliberately misleading you, yeah. or they're only telling you what they know, which may not be the actual external truth. You yeah. know, although there isn't one. Yeah. Um, you know, so I mean, I think when you're reading a first person narrative, and then there's another narrative breaks in or another point of view then you then you reassess and that, yeah. that's certainly something I was interested in doing and yeah. I think you know when you know there's something that the first person allows yeah. you to do yeah. um, even yeah. although I will never write no, another novel in the first person <laughs> no way <laughs> um, yeah. um, I mean when you actually the book opens with various points of view mm-hmm. on the same thing which yeah. I think makes it very interesting yeah and they're entirely contradictory yeah, and about, yeah. About each individual enough that you know you start to warm to some you maybe yeah. start to believe other yeah, ones yeah. which uh, before you even get to the main bulk of the novel uh-huh. start, you start to colour yeah. you know, your idea about it yeah. um, why did you say sorry can I just yeah, say, course, why did you say we don't write um, first person again because well I mean I think with writing in a, a sort of historical novel you know yeah. you um if you're writing a novel set in contemporary glasgow contemporary yeah. london or uh, any kind of environment that people you can expect a reader to be familiar with yeah. then i think you're in kind of safe ground you can say they walk down the street and hailed a taxi yeah. um, or i walk down the street and hailed a taxi and everybody knows what that is but when you're writing about an environment that n- none of the readers are familiar with because we, nobody was alive then uh, all the things that you can quite easily do in the third person, like stop and describe something or actually explain something, you can't really do that so, so easily in, in the first person because yeah. you have to pay attention to whether your narrator would, why would they be ex- suddenly explaining this because it's entirely yeah, familiar yeah. to them. Yeah. So it's, it's, I found that very, that was a real constriction when I was doing this book and, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, cr- created some problems for myself there. <laughs> That's why there's a map in the book because uh, like a map can you know one page just sort of lay a whole lot of stuff out that um, middle earth yeah <laughs> yeah totally yeah, yeah. Um, so I mean let's talk a little bit about place and, and time if you like but I mean how did you because yours is obviously mm-hmm. it's historic and you know a few years before yeah. 1990s Glasgow mm. um, how did you approach that I mean, there was a lot of research to be done um, I did well my mum uh, is from West Ross right. and so it's a part of the country we went up there three times a year as, when I was a kid and I still go up there you know three or four times a year so from sort of geographical point of view I'm pretty familiar with it and I'm sort of familiar with um, some of the I mean I, I would never claim to be a, a local I, I'm not but you know, you get kind of familiar to some extent with the sort of way of thinking up there, which is a little bit different from the sort of central belt. Um, but in terms of the period, I mean, yeah, I mean, I did, um, I did a good chunk of research on, and you know, I read sort of the various sort of normal histor- historical books that deal with the period. But the real, when you're writing a novel, what matters is not the sweep of history. Yeah. It matters of like. Did they have knives and forks? Yeah. You know, um, or, you know, what kind of furniture would they have? You know, um, how many sheep or cattle would they own? You know, all that sort of, what did they eat? Yeah. Um, all that kind of stuff. And that, that stuff is, is much more difficult to find out. I mean, there is a sort of a go-to Bible called Highland Folkways, which was written by a woman called Isabel Grant, who also founded the Folk Museum up at Newton Moor, which is a brilliant place. Um, and that's tremendously helpful. But then... Sometimes you're reading like something that was she's describing something that 1820 in Sutherland, and you go, all right, okay, so that's how it was. And then you think, hold on, 1920 in Glasgow was very different from 
1970 in London. Yeah. You know, so you you know you everything's compressed the further away you get That's from right. it. Yeah. But it's also you also come to realise that um, actually there's some stuff that nobody's bothered to write down. So once you've got a general picture of it in your head, you know I want to put that picture across to the audience. Nobody who reads this book was there. Yeah. You know I know there are certain small historical inaccuracies in the book which are there for you know, sort of uh, novelistic reasons. You know, the school in the village wasn't actually there until 1872, yeah. but it suits me that, yeah. you know, my, my central character goes to school. So yeah, I did a lot of research. I also did, like, um, I did some research in the National Archives and stuff, looking at old uh, cases of this kind of nature, which is f fascinating, you know, and there's lots of really rich material there. Um, and uh, things like the statistical accounts of Scotland are a treasure trove of yeah. information and even reading between the lines of those where they um, might just enumerate the the deaf and mute population and the uh, the insane and those born out of wedlock and it's like hold on a second this is you know 19th century yeah. Presbyterian rural Scotland and there are kids being born out of wedlock oh right people had sex <laughs> you know they you know they had feelings and emotions like we did and that's yeah. kind of I didn't want to write the sort of noble crofter story I wanted to write a sort of dirty story with characters who have sort of you know unpleasant motivations you know and things like that I would imagine that stuff is really hard to find because that's the stuff that people at the time didn't want other yeah. you know, folk to know about yeah sure I mean yeah, you, again it's like you know when you look at sort of crimes committed you know you, one of the most common murders it seemed that happened up there was uh, women killing their you know their infants and this was right. probably um, for because they were born out of wedlock I mean I, I don't know if how common it was but um, you know it's not something you hear about a great no. deal now but uh, so yeah again then it just leads you to think what was, what's the story but what's that you know little two line two lines in a 19th century newspaper you know what's the story behind that you know there are writers like Malcolm Archibald writes stuff about this kind of thing and he's a kind of archive writer yeah. and gets stuff from the archives and I could see myself going back and doing Doing something, yeah, it's just it's, it's all very interesting. Um, and going back to 1990s Glasgow, you know, you so it was written at the time, yeah, in the time and place, yeah, yeah. As, as I think, probably all my books are, I'm just thinking of your books of your one was a completely different time, mm. another was a different country. Mm. That sounds like hard rock to me. I just, yeah. <laughs> I, I've, I've never done that, I was just day to date, certainly. It's not the way my imagination works. I, I've always. Um, tend to write just as in the where I am I've um, kind of lived my whole adult life in Glasgow and it's kind of and I like the uh, the kind of the, the Glasgow novel or I don't know at least most of the part of it um, so I it's not the research seems to have worked to me in so, terms of the place but it is quite interesting that um, also been in Glasgow in that yeah. time it does feel quite like a long time ago now even oh, though yeah. it's not particularly yeah, yeah. Well, I just started thinking of the. I was thinking this the other day. Actually, you know that um, Alistair Gray quote from Lanark at the time about you know Glasgow's mm -hmm. never been thought of imaginatively. Yeah. Like, <coughs> once again, the world a few bad novels and a musical. So mm -hmm. you can't say that anymore. No, uh, certainly, absolutely. since I mean, there's a plethora of like mm -hmm. novels coming out of Scotland, certainly, uh, and probably Glasgow. Mm -hmm. But I've always liked that. I like fictionalising somewhere that I know rather than doing research into a different location that I know nothing about to me that would be a really mm -hmm. struggle I think to make that seem real to myself so I just it should be natural just uh, it's natural for me to place are, are all the locations I mean you have like I'm off the yeah. top of my head like you, the, the Mitchell Library appears yeah. a number of times I'm sure, I'm sure I remember other real locations are yeah. all of the locations real or are some of them sort of fictionalised 99% of them I think are real from um, mm. and it's amazing how it I mean, I think um, I think I mentioned um, Thirteenth Note, for example. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking back, I suppose that around, and, and it certainly was in the nineties. So, <laughs> pubs and things are, yeah, uh, yeah, and it's you know for the a lot of it happens in the south side where I happen to live. So mm -hmm. I, it was at the time the flat I was living at the time. That's where the oh, yeah. narrator lived. Yeah, yeah. I like to do all that all the time, although. Mm -hmm. Clearly, the narrator is not me. Um, <laughs> all these, they all say that. <laughs> all these surface things are. I like uh -huh. doing that. Uh, well, I, yeah. 
There's a pleasure for the reader. I mean, if you're, you know, no Glasgow, I always find a pleasure reading about, oh, hey, oh yeah, Thurston you Snow or yeah. Mitchell, you know, and um, yeah. their, their pleasure of recognition is, it's a nice pleasure. I it mean, is, it's, you and know, you can't and, deny it, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And it is what that Alistair Gray thing about creating the city imaginatively. People start thinking about their city in a different way as a location where yeah. stuff like that happens. It almost sort of makes it worthy, yeah. you know. Um, well, Lanark was the first book I'd ever read yeah. that I recognised the place yeah, with. Yeah. I mean, I was, you know, it was all American, all was odd, you know, London, yeah, yeah. it never yeah, occurred yeah, yeah. to me that, I, you know, a, a Scots, and it was my introduction to Scottish literature really mm-hmm. from that, mm-hmm. and it just blew me away to that, mm-hmm. just then, it was fantastic. Mm-hmm. But it was a great way, as an introduction, for Lanark to be your kind of introductory book. Oh, book yes, books. absolutely, yeah, it started at the, at the very yeah. top, really. Mm-hmm. Um, well, that's a good place to ask about how you think Scottish writing, for want of a better term, is at the moment. I particularly think it's it's in a healthy, healthy state, but I wonder how you being on the other side of things uh, feel. Um, well, well, I say a healthy state in terms of writing, perhaps not a healthy state in terms of people getting published and actually selling books. I'm aware of that. Yeah. Side of well, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I can I honestly don't feel I can comment. I don't know how Graham feels, but I don't think of myself as a Scottish writer. Yeah. Or, you know, um, you don't, I don't, I didn't, I mean, I, you've written some very nice things about the book and its relationship with Scottish literature. I, I see it more as a European book in yeah. some ways, and you mentioned Crime and Punishment. But there are plenty of Scottish books which are also European Well, books, I mean, and Ke- James Kelman to me is a European writer, yeah. you know, and um, but he's also a Scottish writer. Yeah. And so it's like that kind of, you know, um, you don't. Is the problem with labels? Yeah, totally. I mean, you know, you get it with, you know, women writers. Nobody ever calls, you know, me or Graham a man, a male writer, yeah. a man writer. Or at least I've never been called that. Um, I probably am a man writer. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, so yeah, I think when you're writing something, you don't, I, no, I, I try not to think that. about what kind of book I write. I'm not thinking, is this a crime novel? Oh, I better put some more crime in it. Or yeah. it's, I don't, this, I, mean, I need some more references to Scottish literature. I need to draw more on that, or I should go away and read some Neil Gunn, which I've never done, for example. Yes. Um, so I, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, you get a false impression from your own sort of friends and colleagues and the people you meet, and everybody's uh, sort of having a good time and Kirsten Ennis is winning, you know, not, not. Not not the booker or not the booker, no. uh, not not the <laughs> don't booker. Don't that was a satire, <laughs> or, um, you know. So you know, it's and it's good to see people do well, and I think it is hard for the smaller publishers to get their get their their stuff sold in in the shops down in London. Distribution is a a key key yeah. thing, you know, and uh, you know, as a you know, when your book comes out, you know, you you know, who wouldn't want their book to be in the front window of Waterstones, you know? Of course, um, but you'd like it to be stocked in the shops. I've worked in bookshops. I know how people buy books, and they go in and if they can see it, they're more likely to buy it. Yeah, and that's how. It, so it's a kind of self fulfilling prophecy. You need to get this the stuff into the shops. So I mean, you know, if you got like somebody like say the Hunt along to, and some of them, and you know, Adrian to yeah. do a podcast, they have a far more informed view um, about that kind of stuff. But um, I don't know if it's in good health. I mean, you're probably standing back and have a better idea than. Um, I think in terms of, uh, I mean, we spoke just before we started about yeah. um, feeling part of a community of writers, mm. and I think that is important, and I think that's yeah. quite uh, quite healthy at the moment. Yeah, yeah. There does seem to be a general support among, uh, maybe it's that kind of thing, it's just hardly, we're all, you know, struggling here, so let's all struggle together, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I've certainly found uh, other writers, I mean, my first book came out two and a half years ago, I found the writing community very very supportive I think the Scottish Book Trust do lots of fantastic things and uh, yeah so from that point of view I think it's, it seems very vibrant I mean and certainly living in Glasgow probably the same in Edinburgh yeah. in the central belt where it's quite easy to get a crowd in uh, and there's all you know there's Highland Arts I think are quite active in doing stuff obviously it's harder to get people together up there um, but yeah, I mean, I think people are very supportive. Yeah, I think uh, yeah, it's, uh, I don't know if it's the, the state of Scottish literature, but I think it's. And I, I don't choose the books that I read based on the, the nationality mm. of no. the but mm. I, I don't have a problem with being called a Scottish writer because yeah. I'm Scottish and I'm a writer. So, but yeah. that's I know that yeah, people yeah, can look yeah. beyond that. But yeah. um, I mean, your list that you put on uh, yesterday, thanks very much. Your top yes. ten <laughs> books. I mean, I mean that when you take that wee snapshot, uh-huh. the diversity of within. Ten titles. Yeah, of how I mean, many were published in Scotland this yeah. year? It's. I mean, that's incredible. I think 
the Scottish independent publishers are producing it of seem to have tapped into a rich theme of mm. literature, which is fantastic. How many books they're selling, I've no idea. Yeah. And uh, how, I have no idea how many uh, mm. in my book. And I think mm. that is difficult. And I was speaking to somebody about this, and it's, uh, people are always ask, you know, how, how, how's your yeah. book doing? Yeah. 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 <laughs> I don't write it to, to be a bestseller. And be, yeah. it's, it's great, it's, it's a real buzz getting published. But it's almost that, and I think the music business in Scotland's the same, uh, or the music scene, it's, it's almost writers writing to themselves and readers or people in the know, but the, I suspect the number of book sales are probably where they were. It's just spread a lot more thinly. Yeah. Mm. And there's a diversity of ways to, to buy a book or to buy, it's not records anymore, clearly, mm. your stream songs and stuff. And it's mm. it actually put me off writing in a way when I couldn't get Old Marina Girl published. I read a thing that uh, my man Kundera wrote of all people like, about 10, 15 years ago and said, how do I write anymore? There's just so many books published. Yeah. And it's, and you spend, you know, 18 months, two and a half years writing and, writing <coughs> and you get a, you know, 200 word review or something, which is maybe good. Yeah. You know, what, what, what am I doing this for? You must have to really be well, in the, really want to do it yeah, uh, yeah. or have to do it um, almost it would be interesting uh, to know what Kinder's answer to that his own question was since he's now uh, done mm. it but um, or, or kept publishing but it is that I've no idea for the state of it is but I do ask I mean I, I love the fact that there's a real diversity of Scottish books being published out there which has to be a good thing I yeah. think and, um, and I, I think, think the quality provided they're of a good quality and I think sure. many I, of yeah. them are I think yeah. it's incredibly important that Scotland has you know a, a number of independent publishers um, yeah. you know and I just think it's I mean my my experience with Saturday has been absolutely fantastic and I know how hard they work um, and I just think it's totally crucial that um, it's recognised that the publishers in a way are more important than the writers because you know without them our books aren't getting published yeah. and um, I don't know I just think it's a sort of uh, if Creative Scotland are listening um, <laughs> You know that it's just crucial. You know for the you know what they would probably call it the the publishing ecology of Scotland. You know, um, it's just very. It's yeah, very but important. I think as well, it's almost a, a message for other writers out there. I mean, it's great that there are now a handful of independent Scottish publishers out there, and I'm saying there's you know there's a lot more Scottish books published now than there were a decade ago. So if you're a writer still waiting for your first book mm. to be published, you're thinking, ah, oh, great, now's the time. Mm. It's no, I, I don't think it's necessarily any easier. I mean, my. That uh, Omarina Girl was rejected by every independent Scottish publisher over 10, 15 years. Right. Everyone mm. knocked it back. Uh, for just reason, I mean, it was flawed. But right. um, I was very lucky enough that it landed on sales desk and she got it, but I still needed to work on it mm. between her accepting it and publication. But it's not necessarily <laughs> any easier. I mean, it is that whole, you know, Beatles thing. You can be rejected, rejected, rejected. And, and you could be crap, but you could also mm -hmm. have something that is well, worth publishing. I mean, yeah, yeah, you could. I mean, but yeah, sometimes it's important to remember that things get rejected for good reasons sometimes. You know? Yeah, oh, And not everything is worthy of being published. No, absolutely yeah. not. Oh, no. But uh, you must have had something that you believed in that book to keep going yes, back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it, was, uh, it was It was. unfinished business for me. Anyway. Mm. And I'd, there's no doubt the book was developed from being put in a, a cupboard for 15 years. Uh, taking it out every year or so and tweaking it and going back and going or waiting for a, a Sarah Hunt to come along and doing that but um, there's no doubt it's benefited from that yeah. and I think a lot of writers would probably you know two, three, five years after the book's been published mm. go oh, I wish I could go back and well, I think and even, like, even if you leave a draft um, yeah, for you know, yeah. two or three, a couple of months, and then go back and read it you, its flaws leap out at you yeah. Yeah, suddenly, and uh, yeah. it's, it's great to have that yeah. You know, stand Fill back, off, you know, it. don't leave it alone, don't think about it. I mean, okay, 15 years is an extreme <laughs> example, <laughs> um, but uh, I think it's kind of a quite important part of the process. But, and, you know, it's like, I mean, uh, it's maybe something that publishers will, uh, you know, say, oh, when's your book going to be read? And, you know, you want to please them. Yeah. I mean, I'm not really in that situation, but I can imagine that it's like, we need your new book by April, and you don't, yeah. it's, you don't have time to do that. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, I think it's, it's good to... Yeah, neither was I even, even ranking yet. Oh, yeah, no. <laughs> um, you mentioned that you're never going to write in first person again. Mm -hmm. Saying that now, maybe it's last word. Mm -hmm. uh, is there anything else that you've taken from the last couple of books that you think, right, I want to do something different or I'm definitely going to do something different? Um, 
it's, I, don't, I don't I mean I do have some ideas of I've got I've probably got an I- ideas for about five new five projects and uh, you know but there's no point planning two years ahead because you know you you just have a different idea by right. then I mean the good thing about writing novels is you only need one idea every 18 months you know it's not like being a short story writer or a poet yeah um, and uh, I think the thing is you have to commit to the idea I mean with his bloody project um, I did struggle with the writing of it of course I did and I think it's right that you struggle but I kind of always had faith in the sort of central concept of the book I think it was quite a strong idea uh, it's strong in the sense of you know um, not that strong as in good but strong as in this is something that can sustain a novel yeah um, yeah Whereas with the other book, it began with some men in a bar. I mean, I had no idea where it was going to go. Oh, really? Um, That's interesting. And so I just started, I told myself I was writing a short story and let's see what happens. But I knew it was going to be a novel. Uh, but I was just kind of playing tricks on myself. To, but it was my first time, you know. Well, it wasn't I'd written a novel before, which is, we'll never see the light of day. Um, so yeah, I don't know what I've learned. I've, I think I've learned that... Um, not planning I don't want to plan yeah. I'm really anti-planning yeah but that is tough you know it's, yeah, it's exactly I mean right. I was going to ask you when you were talking about you know sort of writing yourself into a cul-de-sac yeah you know I think that comes because you're just letting the story develop as you write and it does lead to that point where you go okay I've got this far but how do I get out of this this spot yeah. I put my character yeah. in or yes but uh, which happens and did happen but interestingly because uh, I was asked this question when, when we launched it at the, the I Write Festival was uh, how do you end the book or mm. your, and I always start at the end or I part know. of the when mm. I have my initial idea of that you know, almost eureka moment and go mm-hmm. right now I've got it it's an end twist or it's an end uh-huh. that I have in mind yeah, so and part of the thing yeah. is the start, and I know the start and it's almost like and it's like getting to the yeah, end yeah, no, so and then point can change yeah, yeah. But yeah. I, or something uh-huh. that makes me go that is driving a narrative to get to what I want to be at the end um, and interestingly it was the end that uh, when I can see I picked it up after the 15 years I said uh, mm-hmm. live this the end doesn't work <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> oh, wow. and I had to rework or, but right, I right. got to a stage where the end was in my head rather than on, on the page but, uh, right. so I had to uh, re- revisit that but that's how I tend to yeah. I've heard other writers say that as well the idea right. of starting a book without knowing where it's going to finish really scares them mm. whereas I've also spoken to writers who said right I, I begin and see where the characters take me yeah. which that sounds terrifying to mm. me I think without yeah. having any structure at all Yeah. but um, I suppose it depends it what works for you uh, I mean that's what I'm, I'm in, in sort of halfway through a new project and you know it, I'm doing it in the sort of let's see where this goes yeah. fashion Um and haven't got halfway through it, I'm now beginning to sort of go, okay, right, this bit, this aspect, I can't have both these sort of subplots because they're, so I've kind of written stuff and I'm going to have to chuck some away, which is absolutely fine, I don't mind chucking stuff away. Um, but yeah, it's, um, then you then you start, I think your mind starts going on to what is going to happen. Uh, but it feels organic yeah. rather than I'm sitting down to write a sort of five act, sort of screenplay-esque, sort of narrative arc you know, which is the way that some people yeah. work and it's a perfectly valid sort of way to work but I avert my eyes from all yeah. these kind of tips because I'm, yeah. I'm scared that once you've seen them you can't unsee them and, um, it goes back to that original point about how some people view crime fiction as yeah. you know Peggy goes into slot B yeah, and they're all yeah. kind of fun and some people yeah. like that I mean yeah, yeah. you know well it works I mean, my just, yeah. dad uh, read the 50s 57th precinct it was the uh, uh-huh, American the main, uh, the yeah, main yeah, books yeah. and I started yeah. to pick them up and they were just pretty much the same every uh-huh. time you went yeah, yeah yeah there's even a there's even a paragraph that he kind of cuts and pastes even you know, cut, and, <laughs> cut and paste about the character uh, Meyer Meyer who's gone bald and it's because uh, he went bald prematurely because uh, he was named Meyer Meyer his father called him he had the same first name and second name that paragraph is in every single Ed McBain novel I'm like Hats off to you. <laughs> you're, not, you're, not even, you're not even changing the words or making it even different. Just then it goes. Yeah. But so, and some people like that familiarity. Yeah, I think yeah. that's why a lot of yeah, crime yeah. fiction like that Absolutely. sells a huge amount. And publishers want uh, returnable stuff. And you know, look, Ian Rankin tried to get away from 
um, Inspector Rebus yeah. wrote a couple of books about another character and then he's back on Rebus and Why Garland and, you know fair enough but uh, I mean I'm sure Ian Rankin doesn't need the extra money from more Rebus novels but it seems like maybe he misses them as well yeah, yeah maybe yeah or maybe he just needed a break from them I mean I, I'm struggling to write a second novel with the same character at the moment but uh, just th- I thought the, um, now that you've both uh, been published by Contraband um when you come to think about what you're going to do next, is that a consideration at all? That you're in, uh, uh, it's supposed to be a crime fiction? Yeah, not for me. No, no. not at all. I mean, I think, I mean, again, it's like, I don't think this bloody project is a crime novel. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I've discussed it with the publisher. Um, was there ever any thought that it wasn't going to be on contraband? Um, I think there was a thought about it, yeah. I mean, I think if that was the first novel that I'd done with them, it might have going on the Saraband yeah. label it doesn't really matter to me no no um, no. you know um, I think the only thing that matters to me if you create re- expectations in the reader by saying something's a crime novel that uh, they might think it's going to be in a certain way yeah. I mean his bloody project it's a very it's a very literary novel in the way it's constructed you know and that some people might be a bit sort of you know unimpressed with that if they're looking for an immediate I haven't said that there is actually a murder on the first page yeah. <laughs> so you know it actually fulfills the sort of crime hey, novel sort of you can't you know, undo these things and you know it's like it's right, it's, it, I, I absorbed the lesson um, but I, I I don't want to get into that way of thinking no. like oh I'm a, I'm a crime writer I don't think of myself as a crime writer yeah um, I think going back to the idea of labels uh, yeah. uh, putting labels on writers or any artist it's it's obviously problematic, particularly I think for the artist, the writer themselves. But then, in terms of publishers and, and booksellers and all that, mm. it kind of serves its purpose that way yeah, as well, absolutely. which uh, which can be can be difficult, you know. Yeah, and bookshops are divided into crime fiction and fiction. You know? Yeah, um, and uh, I know. I remember um, we did a, a podcast with Louise Welsh and. She, you know, gets invited to bloody Scotland, yeah. and her books are on yeah. the crime fiction, and yeah, I just yeah. never thought of her as a crime writer well, until she's, I. She's an interesting it. example. I mean, you know, the cut, the first one, the cutting room. Yeah. I mean, that is a crime novel. Yeah, uh, it's got a character who's uh, not a detective, but he plays a detective yeah. oh, just as your character is mm-hmm. not a detective. He's a yeah. journalist. Or, yeah, yeah. Uh, he kind of plays the role of the detective yeah. for you know, in the terms of the structure of the book, and most, you know, uh, you know, it's not always a detective figure, but there's somebody who's playing that. The quest role. Yeah, who's um, uncovering the clues but, for Yeah, you. I think she's a she's a literary writer who r- writes novels about crime often, um, and you know an interesting example. Yeah, and I think just pragmatically embraces yeah. where if you yeah. want to invite me to your thing, you know, I'm happy to turn up. And yeah, yeah, totally. Well, the, the other thing I think from a publisher's point of view, um, crime sells. Yeah, and you know uh, publishers need to sell their books, and the authors want them to sell their books as well. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, uh, it, it may be a decision kind of based on that. But you can't you can't put something on a crime imprint if it's clearly not not yes. any crime. <laughs> you know, it's um, romantic fiction. You know, yeah. Oh, that's pains, I suppose. Yeah. Um, and what are you going to be uh, writing next? Are you writing in the next year? Yeah, I am. It's uh, it's at very formative stages, though. It's probably not something. I can even talk about no, fair enough. but uh, no it's uh, not it's not being mysterious about it anyway but it's just it's early stages uh, but yeah I'm just kind of getting into it and starting to build up a momentum and doing mm-hmm. something but at the moment it is first person again I kind of I think that was the first first person book I did with my girl and I kind of quite liked it and it kind of raises various uh, kind of issues for me that I find quite mm-hmm. quite interesting uh, the interest now to make it a different first person narrative voice to, to that one yeah. but um, at the moment it's that anyway but that it even itself could change but yeah I've got an idea in mind and I'm kind of at various stages I've got the end I just <laughs> and I've got the start when uh, Sarah said that the, that, that the end wasn't that was that was problematic with it yeah. and you hadn't maybe yeah. looked at it in depth in detail for some time yeah um, how did it feel going back to it and these characters and these yeah these as I say Puzzles that you'd laid all those years previously. Yeah, that was funny because. Uh, Did you have trouble for it working out? Oh, I mean, she caught me on the hop. She phoned me up and, <laughs> and said, oh, "I'm not expecting. I sent this email. You expect never to hear anything again. Yeah. Just like the previous years." And she phoned me. Uh, I was in the office and said, oh, "I love this. I've been, you know, I've been doing anagrams. So tell me, what's this, this author?" And I was like, oh, "Fuck, 
<laughs> having a clue and I started rambling and t- making up uh, so what happened was this a character fragment of his imagination was this and I was like uh, can I phone you back <laughs> yeah it was uh, phone a friend kind of thing so I really had to revisit the book uh-huh. uh, and when I did revisit the end uh, then I, I could it was clear that it was problematic it was just I had the end all in my head and I've always liked kind of enigmatic endings yeah, I've, I've yeah, always yeah. that's what I like in <coughs> fiction of you're left feeling alright mm. I like it being left to the reader's imagination but that was just leaving it a bit too much to the reader's imagination mm. I just needed to put some yeah, flesh yeah. on the bones and yeah. really it was ended up just writing the end that I should have written uh, way before and I was putting it but even then I thought I'd done it and I was going back to Craig Hillsley who, who edits the at Salmon Books and he was like yeah, yeah, but still, we need mm. to, really, you want more than this? Yeah. So, and it was not a big amount of words, but just mm. another paragraph we're going to. Yeah. And then, and that went through about probably four or five throughout the whole book, but mostly at that end piece, just kind of, uh, just really, not spelling it out, yeah. but putting but it that, just that, a to bit me, that's the, the great difficulty of writing any scene is, you know, you want the, the scene to have, whether it's the ending or not, yeah. to have the the impact or, or the effect on the reader that you want it to have. But the last thing you want to do is lay it on too thick. So, you know, always sort of read yeah, it in and yeah, hope yeah. that the reader is getting what you're saying. And, but yeah. you, you only know that when you give it to somebody to read and um, find out whether they, they've got it sure, as yeah, you yeah. intended it to, or if you've spelled it out to, you know, yeah. in sort of huge letters and it's, you know, over the top. Yeah, I, th- I think that's quite a, I mean, I suppose, you know, it's a, an experience thing as well. You, you get better at sort of yeah. knowing when you've done enough uh, yeah. to get your point across. And and uh, uh, talking about the editing process in general, how do you find that when you're you're handing it over to someone else? Um, I uh, <laughs> I mean, my attitude is my rational brain says <laughs> <laughs> uh, everything that anybody suggests to you is with the intention of making your yes. book better. And I think that's um, true. Uh, you know, if you're working with somebody who you're generally on the same page with, um, then I, you know, you have to listen to everything they say. I do a bit of copy editing for sort of articles myself. So yeah. I've been on the other side of the table, and I'm always, you know, I always kind of take a softly, softly approach and know that people can be a bit precious about, you know, being pointed out that they don't know how to use punctuation. Yeah. Um, but. Um, I uh, I'm not very good at plotting and narrative. And uh, when I was doing the first book, uh, somebody was like, "Yeah, you know, why'd you give the the whole thing away on the you know the fifth page?" And I'm like, "Well, I didn't expect anybody, you know, to be interested in whether did he or didn't." Yeah. And they were like, "Well, I am interested." <laughs> I'm like, "All right, okay." So and then so that sort of thing of um, structuring events and uh, in the the trial in, in this book. You know, I, I, in the editing process, I rejigged that quite a lot so that there was more tension and more ups and downs in the trial. And that was something I kind of did with at Craig's, the editor's yeah. prompting. And, you know, that is useful and it makes the book better, definitely. Yeah. I mean, it's 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 tiresome. Yes. You know, because you, you get to the... I, I could mess around uh, with the prose forever. You know, yes. and, and uh, when you know when I'm doing readings, you know I still edit prose, and I'm yeah. sometimes like, oh my god, I can't believe I used that phrase. But I think you know that's, you've got to stop something. So publishers' deadlines actually become handy because yeah, totally, yeah, yeah, well, to absolutely, yeah, out. definitely, and uh, yeah, there's an element of discipline there. Uh, but yeah, I've, I haven't found it too painful, uh, really, and I know that the books are getting better, so. You don't. Nobody's forcing you. you yeah. Can. And also, I think if you're not generally cooperative, if you do have a point where you're like, actually, I don't agree with you, and here's why. If you do that about everything, you're yeah. just you're just being a pain in the ass to work with. Yeah. And uh, people would be like, well, he's hard to work with. Let's not do anything else with him. Just on that, I was a, yeah. I was a complete pain in the ass. To <laughs> <laughs> that explains the fifteen years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The editing process was a joy, but I actually stopped the press, and they had gone to press, and, then, oh. and I was reading it over the weekend, and uh, <clears> and it was just because they're so and it was, it was quite intricate. I was, and it was a mistake that I'd made mm. through the editing process, and very near the end, it was mm. this. I mean, this sentence doesn't make sense. I've just completely 
So and it'd been sent to the press before I was like, say that we need to take the fact. So fortunately the press. Uh, it was kind of stopped the press. Brilliant. It was just ridiculous. <laughs> But, um, it's a little boy with a flat cap and a hot <laughs> right yeah, 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 yeah. metal yeah. stuff and all that stuff. But uh, so I, I can relate to that. But yeah, I think it, I I don't I, I I really enjoyed the editing process of this working with Craig, just somebody else because it's I, I used to edit uh, a magazine and uh, I used to and I've edited a couple of books for other um, not not fiction books but for another publisher uh-huh. you know, and I, I enjoy editing. But it's impossible to edit your own. It's impossible mm. to see it subjectively yes. or objectively. Yeah, yeah. yeah. To, um, so it's great. I, I welcome that kind of third, mm. third party mm. kind of pointing out things. And it was never. It wasn't heavy handed. I made yeah. I've picked bodies before and um, comes around. It was the same. It was. Um, it, was it was useful having the, that. Yeah. Just um. But you, uh, as an editor yourself, yeah. I mean, what's your experience of working with writers? Are they generally cooperative? Generally co- cooperative. Yeah. Um, the, th- the most difficult thing I think is when people um, have put a lot of research in mm. and want to show how yeah. much research that they've put yeah. um, and that's that can be the most difficult conversation mm. um, but hopefully you know that they can eventually see that and, and there have been I've edited books where there's been long discussions about it and it's been kept in because uh-huh. the writer yeah. just and it is the writer's book and the, yeah, at the sure. end of it but yeah, um, it's usually a, a, it's an enjoyable process on the whole. Um, yeah, I've never had. Of course, uh, what we really want things. is for you to tell us who's really difficult to work with. <laughs> <laughs> well, but once this is uh, turned <laughs> off, I, I'll do. I'll maybe do just that. Um, a previous uh, publisher before just at Black Ace Books, and uh, and I think he, he was a couple of us had launched books. This has come back, you know, two decades or something. And he said that the authors he finds easiest to work with. And I was included in this. Was uh, writers, uh, journalists. Mm. There's quite, a, yeah. there's quite a lot of uh-huh. journalists getting books published just now. Yeah. And journalists like myself are used to getting, or oh, right, you need it, uh, four hundred words, yeah. four fifty words, or you know, six hundred <coughs> words, and, and it being copy edited, being sub edited, mm. uh, so not that precious. I can mm. imagine if you're not working with words every day, and it is yeah. your masterpiece, then yeah, you yeah. can get precious about it. And yeah. I, Although I'm stopping the press, I'm not actually that precious. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I really so, sometimes I must. I, I, I can't believe I'm sending this email to Sarah and it's like it's the font or something or like yeah. the spacing on the page, and she puts up with all with very good grace. Yeah. I, yeah, I suppose I don't think. I think that's not a bad thing actually, because you know that kind of level of detail can make quite a difference. I know, but yeah. uh, I remember <laughs> once there was a, there was a book um, which was reviewed, and one of the criticisms of it was that there wasn't enough margin space. Right, you think, oh, come on, well, that's like you're you're disappearing in <coughs> Yeah, there. but um, I, I think when you get to that level, yeah, most of the editing's probably yeah, oh, yeah, 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 that's just, yeah. Um, um, and actually, I've also found that when when if books need lots taken out of it, then actually a writer can get related to that as well and start to mm-hmm. see yeah. where this is this is you know yeah, necessary. Yeah, yeah. It's, I think you know you've got you kind of got a bit a um, bit of a word count in your head when you're writing a novel. Yeah. Um, and so when you're writing, you're like, I mean, I I I, I watch the little numbers at the bottom go go up. You go right, yeah, yeah, getting there, getting there, and uh, so. Well, you know, once you've got the big pile of words, it becomes a lot easier to take some out. Yeah. Um, but it's getting getting to the getting to the sort of eighty thousand mark or whatever your sort of market you want it to be. Even though that's a kind of stupid way to. There's no reason. And one of the nice things about again about contraband is uh, they're not concerned that a novel has to be a certain length. I mean, your novel's probably what sixty thousand or something. I'd guess. And uh, whereas when I was working with an agent before which was an incredibly useful experience um, and the first draft of Adele Bado was 60,000 words he said it's going to be 20,000 words longer right and I was like and he's like that's that's what the publishers want and um, yeah and I felt like it was a bit it was a bit of an arb it's just a number and yeah. as it happened in the process of doing the rewrites that I did for for him uh, it came to like 79,000 words and I actually wrote a cheeky email saying, I'll give you the other 50 if you want, um, which was probably a bit um, but but it, sure. But I would the conversation with that where, you know, people have said, well, really, ideally, we'd like it to be 80,000 uh-huh. because then it, it's it's extra money if you take it over that. Right. And that's the, 
the kind uh-huh. of uh-huh. financial aspect sure, of it, which yeah, is a horrible bit, thing to have to turn yeah, talk about. Publishers or businesses as well. Yeah, you know, yeah. yeah. Um, so what? For questions to both of you, what are you kind of up to next in terms of, in terms of not right now? I mean, uh-huh. in terms of writing and. Yeah, well, as I say, I'm just early stages of a. But after Omarina Girl, I time my hand at a, a non fiction piece, and it was a, a real kind of rant about things that were going on in the world at the moment, which again fell on deaf ears. And, and, and that's it's almost a starting point using that. I'm, I'm actually taking inspiration from Graham here and use, well, I think a book within a book, which mm-hmm. I've used before, but that kind of. I'm playing around with that, uh-huh. adapting what I've done. Uh, into the kind of themes that I think are, are of interest uh, to me just now. I'm kind of surfacing that, but a bit more explicitly that, than they appear in Old Marina Girl just now. I can see that, I don't know if you can, but I can, because it's been so long, so I can sit back and see some common threads and just mm. a couple of books I've had published already. Yeah, yeah, and so I think yeah. that one, the one I'm working on just now, will uh, hopefully be completely different, but uh, I can see kind of some common themes or elements. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's good when, it. yeah, when that comes to you afterwards, I mean, I see yeah. common things between my two books, which are very different, yeah. superficially very different, but to me they're almost identical in some ways. Ah, okay. um, but yeah, well, be- even before Disappearance with Elbado was published, I started writing a sequel to it, um, uh-huh. which um, seemed a very foolhardy thing to do when uh, nobody was, uh, uh, you know, the book wasn't published. But, yeah. um, and some of that material got incorporated into this big rewrite I did. Um, so anyway, I'm now I'm, I'm now writing that book, um, featuring the cop from Adele Bedou, um George Gorski. Uh, so he is investigating. Well, he, he Gorski never really does much investigating. Right, he's a kind of anti-cop. <laughs> um, he just wanders around feeling insecure and like you know proper policemen are doing the real detective work existential policemen right? yeah definitely yeah um, so yeah I'm about 30,000 words in I don't know you know I'm beginning to get the shape of it I don't know you know I try you know you think oh is this the book I should be writing now or I, but you know what can you do you know yeah um, I'll just I'm gonna, I'm, I think I'm going to finish it and then see uh, you know write a draft uh, I feel I could do it relatively quickly. I will say that. But, um, <laughs> so yeah, that's what I'm working on. It's called the accident on the A35. There you go. Exclusive. Exclusive. Um, well, uh, I think I think we'll we'll stop there and let you guys get home because um, it, it's a horrible night out there. Yeah, it is, it is. Yeah, thanks for having me. But yes, thank you. Thank you for coming along, and uh, we'll be back next time with. I think it's going to be a roundup of 2015. So we'll speak to you then. Cheers. Bye-bye.